Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. This is Tracy Abbott from That's Microlink PC. I think we'll wait a couple of minutes for everyone to join because it will take a couple of minutes for everyone to sign okay. up. Thank sure. you, Tracy. It's still Tracy Abbott from Microlink PC. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, we would like everyone to hear that wonderful introduction. I think so. I think yeah, so. At the, at the moment, it's important. It's, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're looking good. Thank you. All bouncy. And... Oh, I, I should, I should certainly put my background um, right now because I think it gets the light might come and interfere with the with the screen. You see, I've got my little my little halo glow. Over yes. my head. <laughs> okay, so so we have one more minute and then we will we will go live. Okay. And I use that one, I think. Okay. Oh wow. Uh, now I I think um another few seconds to give everyone the chance to join. Yeah, over to you, Tracy. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's Tracy Abbott from Microlink PC. I'm a white female um, with glasses and long sort of burgundy colored hair, I guess. I'm joined by the fabulous colleagues um, Nasser Siabi, our CEO, and Neil Rogers, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for attending our series of webinars on accessibility and disability and inclusion. My name is Nasser Siabi. I'm the founder, co-founder and CEO of Microlink. I am male, uh, near 60, gray hair, glasses, and pale skin. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Neil Rogers and I'm the Head of Digital Accessibility here at Microlink. And uh, my main remit is to cover web accessibility, uh, mobile accessibility and PDF remediation. Um, I'm a middle-aged uh, man wearing glasses. I have uh, a kind of sort of peppery hair, I suppose, and I'm wearing a, wearing a blue shirt. Thank you, Neil. Can I just remind everybody if you want um, captioning at all, it's a CC button at the bottom of your screen. If you push that, it will come up with uh, the live captioning. So we, we're gonna go through a couple of questions that we've got um, following on from the introduction we had from Neil last week, which I hope you're all able to attend. I wanted to ask- you, Sorry, before you sorry. start, can I interrupt you? If, if anyone has any questions, just please raise your hand and then you will be allowed to talk. Thank you, Asaday, that's really good. Um, Yes, Neil, we were talking the other night about some work that you've been doing recently, and obviously we're not going to mention a company at all, um, but it, it raised some sort of very typical kind of challenges, I think, that you find within making your website and your mobile applications accessible. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, okay, so as, as you mentioned, I'm working with a, um, a pretty major telecommunications uh, client, and uh, in terms of just headline information, one of the, the main sort of areas that we find in terms of websites being inaccessible is things like, for example, color contrast. Uh, okay. so, that's where, so that's where you have maybe, you know, the uh, text, text color or the background color. Uh, there are particular issues with that. Uh, the other aspect is also in terms of um, on certain websites where, for example, um, a, 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 a person developing a website or you know a designer might put text over an image and that can also sometimes cause issues with being able to see um, uh, see the text essentially uh, particularly if it's a busy background background uh, so, uh, so you, when you when you talk about the actual the color contrasting and, and colors are we talking about branding so if somebody uh, looks at a site the very look of it that reminds you of that company uh, that's right. So, uh, in some in some respects, the uh, the web content accessibility guidelines does give uh, a little bit of um, flexibility to to branding, uh, but certainly would recommend 
that if your branding isn't accessible, there is a way of checking that fairly, uh, fairly quickly, fairly easily. Mm. Um, but uh, just generally across your website, if, for example, you know, the, 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 the text color that you're using it needs to meet the branding color that you use, um, is to perhaps just check that the text against the background on the website, um, you know, body text or maybe sort of display text, things like mm. that it can actually be checked. So you can do that quite quickly using a, using a tool. What, one of the things I know we spoke about the other night, we'll go on to more of the, the changes that you found recently, was sure. one of the councils, and I, we probably shouldn't say who they are, Croydon Council, um, but they had like 1% accessibility on their website. And that surely is precluding old people, people like me that can't use technology, people who use assistive technology. I mean, is this a common thing with councils? Uh, yeah, I mean, to, to, to some degree, I mean, there, there are just, to, in, in all fairness, there are some councils that are, that are doing a superb job. There are mm. others that perhaps they, you know, they, they've got room for improvement, shall we say. Um, and it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, something that's, that's important to do. And I think it's, it's, it's being aware that um, if you make those uh, adjustments to your website, I mean, essentially called a reasonable adjustment. I mean, if you're mm. sort of going, going by the Equality Act 2010, okay. if, you, if, if you're following those adjustments, it's, it's actually, it's not we're, not, we're not asking, you know, massive, massive changes here, that these are things that can actually be done, so on your know, low hanging fruit, so to speak. Mm. So you know, things like color contrast, it actually isn't that difficult to do. Um, and it's just, it's just those little changes or the changes that you, you, you implement that can make a big difference to your, to your audience. Uh, particularly, you know, for, for disabled people using your website, um, but also just to, to bear in mind as well that there are many people out there who uh, might not think that you know they, they wouldn't all in, at least see themselves as being disabled, even. Of course. Um, and also, you know, perhaps you know, old, older adults as well, um, you know, to be included in that. So it's there's quite a wide demographic. So if your if your website is inaccessible, you're actually excluding quite a, quite a, a large number of people. Well, what are we talking about? Sorry, were you going to make a comment then? Yeah, Sorry. yeah, I think, I think it's really put a context with this as well. Uh, public sector do an amazing job during the crisis is COVID, and they've yeah. got a very difficult job to do. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, what, Absolutely. What, what tends to happen, unfortunately, is lack of knowledge. It's like telling your disabled uh, clients, I know they're not customers as such, to complain about the service because they're coming for a service that they have to get. Yeah. It's really equivalent of telling them disabled people are not welcome. Just anybody else is okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and really, that's how subtle the message they're giving without realizing. So we've got uh, tons of public sector organizations, especially like the health, um, um, and like NHS. They've got amazing um, uh, team, uh, people who are doing a fantastic job. But when it comes to public information, they really certainly could do more. And that's because yeah. public really look to them to, for how, how do I survive this period? How do I actually look after myself? And that's why it's so important, at least the public sector, isn't, apart from the legality of it's a requirement, we really think that this um, actions that um, Neil just mentioned, simple steps, but it could make a massive difference to that engagement. You, Neil, you gave me some sort of idea of around 20 odd percent of people are probably affected by the lack of accessibility on websites. Yes, I'd say, I mean, okay, um, th this is a sort of a, a, a global figure. So mm. uh, in terms of uh, accessibility for disabled people, so uh, particularly for digital accessibility is, it's, it's about, um, so a, approximately on average, it's, it's 20% of, of the population. Wow. Uh, so that's that's a you know, considerable number. Now, just to give a little bit a little bit of a caveat there, that uh, there, is, there, there is a sort of a, a range between you know because because it's an average. So the, you know the minimum figure is about twelve percent, the maximum is about twenty six percent. So just as I say, just to, to be aware that also within that, uh, it, those figures are likely to be higher because of what we call undisclosed disabilities. Mm. Um, so on average, it's about yeah, it's about twenty percent um, mm. that would be excluded. I, I know I know Europe is not yet as bad as Japan, but in the next 10 years, somewhere like 50% of the population uh, would be above the age of 60, or some ridiculous percentage are going to be old. And wow. they are, at, they are at, at the biggest risk of, um, you know, eyesight failing, hearing failing, you know, hearing loss, and they do need um, catering for. 
So, the so potentially the people with the most money, the most money to spend, uh, to, absolutely. are being excluded the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, absolutely. and again, the, the most, uh, I mean, in a private sector, mm -hmm. uh, getting on to that, look, is a huge um, um, financial opportunity here because we've got mm. the big cohorts that we're not addressing. In a public sector, maybe it hasn't hit them as much. Uh, regulations are tight. Yes, there is a lot of uh, requirements for the public sector. But the action uh, certainly needs to match uh, the words. And I think this is where uh, quick wins in terms of accessibility. I'm not talking about uh, do a quick fix of putting a plug in that makes it a bit accessible. It's just like going to a restaurant and say, well, we don't have accessible uh, ramp to get you to the main, but can you sit by the door and have your <laughs> dinner here? It really is equivalent yeah. of doing a yeah. very shabby job just to sort yeah. of comply. We think we've got to do a whole say change of attitude and approach to assistive tech, uh, sorry, accessibility. Yeah, absolutely. One of the um, things, Neil, ex sorry. Excuse me, uh, we have a live question here. Um, sure. Um, how do you quickly check your brand accessibility? Neil. Okay, I, I'd say that the probably the quickest way to do that is uh, to look at uh, the your color contrast of, for example, your uh, your logos, or you know, if you if you actually got colors within your branding, uh, you can actually do that quite quickly. There's there's a tool that's called uh, the WebAIMS color car color contrast checker, and there's also another one called Who Can Use. And essentially, uh, you can take color values. Um, I can I can show you how to do that at some point. But is is you can take color values. Essentially, like they refer to them as hex numbers. Um, it's basically it's, it's just a number that denotes the color, and you, right. can, actually, you can plug it into to who can use or the, the WebAIM color contrast checker, and it will tell you whether your um, your, your your colors are accessible, uh, particularly for, for for color contrast. Um, so that's that's and it's it's really easy to do. It's not a difficult thing to do. There's also tools available as well that can check, for example, on your website um, you mm -hmm. know, if you're using you know, uh, branded colors as well, and it will, it will tell you automatically uh, whether your uh, colors. Can, can do that so you can do it very quickly what's the cost of, of of reconfiguring a website i mean a ballpark figure obviously you know depends on the size and the complexity yeah i was gonna say i mean that's that's a very sort of um that would be quite a nebulous figure because okay that's for exactly for exactly that reason that it's, mm. it, it does depend on the size of the website but but simply put that if you if you um try to retrospectively mm. alter your website the cost of doing that is considerably more um, and by quite a way um, than if you actually embed accessibility from from the start um, so that's 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 the important thing is is if it's to embed it from the start mm. yeah no, no, and, I, I, Neil, sorry and um, um, someone asked can you please repeat the two na names or maybe yeah. can you um type sure, them yeah. in the chat if you can type them in the chat box at some point that yeah, would be great yeah, absolutely fine. I was going to say, I think the the, the tools, um, the, the the main one for color contrast checking would be the uh, the web aim color con color contrast checker. I can actually just do a um, a quick. Yeah, uh, what we do is we will actually put in the resources, I think, and so okay, you, you, everyone you, can access. It. Yeah, I think there's yeah, probably yeah, do that. if we can put that into our um, when we transfer that sure, information. Yeah. That's the interesting thing for me is obviously the work that you're doing, Neil, which is is exceptional. If you don't mind me saying, embarrassing oh, you. Thank um, you very but much. It's one of the few that really understands what's going on because I know when I worked at BDS, for example, there were so few, and I believe there still are so few web developers mm. that are baking in having accessible features mm. already. Mm. Yeah. Is that an issue that you found? Is that still going on? I, I think to some degree, uh, it's in, and again, in all fairness, there, there, there's. Um, uh, you know, two different types of developers that I've come across. Yeah. There are those that are aware of accessibility and be beginning to you know, implement it, and and certainly to to to, to bake it in from 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 yeah. you know uh, from the get go. Uh, but there are other developers who are still you know perhaps in that stage of learning about accessibility and you know um, trying to understand it. Because in, in all fairness, if you were to go to the Web Content Accessibility Guideline website and you and for the first time you perhaps maybe you'd heard the word accessibility. Yeah okay, I want to try and make my website accessible, and you looked at the Web Content Accessibility Guideline website, it can be overwhelming. I mean, there are oh, literally really? thousands of pages that you'd need to read. Oh, my uh, God. That, that you think, uh, oh, I need to read through. But but the, um, but there are pages, if you know where to look, that can actually give you a very, very quick uh, overview. Absolutely. Actually, without um, um, the risk of um, 
losing people and said, oh, it's too big, we can't do. There are lots of things you can do. Uh, mm. The easiest one, the low-hanging fruit, is to make sure the information you've made available, like PDFs, they are accessible. They're much mm. easier to fix. And, and that's where the source of information for a lot of the public, you know, how to pay my bills, how to uh, claim okay. my benefit. You can do that. And there are tools that uh, we work with can, can make sure that process is easy, doable. And, uh, and I'm sure Neil will go through the um, exceptionally good project he's working with one public uh, authority about how to use unemployed um, uh, autistic people to learn that remediation and actually provide that for the council. So they've complied both in terms of legal obligation as well as creating employment. But more importantly, if I may say this one, there is a shortage of accessibility experts because universities are not training them. And, and quite honestly, that, that side needs to still be addressed urgently. We have an army of um, talented people out of work who could be trained to become accessibility experts. We just need to bring him into the employment cycle. And that's mm -hmm. another big cha challenge. Um, so there are uh, one final point. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go on um, on this subject. But just creating an accessible website or accessible IT platform is a big task. But once you achieve that, the bigger challenge is to how to make sure the people who contribute to the content make sure their content is accessible as well. So training the public to produce the accessible PDFs and PowerPoints and Word, these are the ones that who don't, don't consider themselves as experts, but you need to have the tools to train them to do the right thing. Otherwise, you'll be playing a catch-up all your life. Absolutely. So, Neil, going, going back to the, um, the firm that you've been dealing with, you were talking about colour contrast. What other things were top note? Okay, so I just, like I said, I think the, the sort of the main, the, the main things so if you if you just to, to deal with these things you would be well underway and uh, to make okay. your website accessible so uh, i would say perhaps uh, top three would be uh, color contrast mm -hmm. uh, then number two would be making sure that your website uh, can be used by what's called a screen reader now a, a, a screen reader is simply a, a piece of assistive technology that would allow uh, for example a blind person or someone with a severe visual impairment uh, to be able to essentially hear the content of of the website so it's uh, you know the, the screen reader can go through the website uh, you know using you know, either a keyboard mm. or if it's on a mobile device they can use uh, gestures like swipe gestures and uh, they can actually hear the content um, you know uh, on the website so that's that's another one and i think the other the other thing as well is um, it is to ensure that th things like, for example, headings on your website are uh, what's referred to as nested correctly. Now, just what I mean by nested, okay, mm. is I'm sure every everyone here is probably you know you more than likely used a you know um, Microsoft Word and you've created a document. You have like heading one, heading two. Heading oh right, three. yeah, you yeah, yeah. Use yeah. the different styling, that sort of thing. That's what I'm referring to. So if okay. you have um, uh, to, to make sure that your your headings are nested, you would need to have say you know heading one, then it's followed by heading two and heading three. Uh, in some cases now, I've actually seen this and actually fairly recently on a on a like I said on another client's website. Size, you know, telecommunications giant, um, that they uh, they actually had a, a heading four at the start of the web page followed by a heading one. So that's actually that's not correct uh, nesting of your headings. Now, it may, you may you might think, well, why why do I need to worry about that? Mm. Well, for the, for the very reason that if you're a screen reader user, you can actually use shortcut keys. So you can like you're pressing numbers one to one to six. Oh, okay. Or you press H on your keyboard, um, and you can actually navigate and jump to the to, to, to the appropriate headings. Now, as you can imagine, if the um, that the, the heading isn't nested correctly, yeah, um, yeah. You, and you want to say, okay, I want to jump to a heading one. It says, well, there's there's the, the next heading is a heading four. And you think, well, okay, well, what's what's happening? What have here? I missed? So, yeah, yeah, what have I missed? So, and in some cases, actually, for screen reader users, they might be thinking, okay, um, well, that's all that the information that's on that page. So I, I can't find any further oh. information. So it's basically it, it's important to have your headings nested correctly because a person who's blind can then navigate the page appropriately. Okay, um, then I'm, Neil, sorry, oh, yeah. um, there is one more question. Are these sure. screen readers a program or a setting in a product? 
That's an excellent question. I don't know who asked that. That was a very, very uh, excellent question. Um, okay, so in some in some cases, they are a completely separate uh, piece of software um, or program. Um, so to give you an example, there's one called NVDA. Now that's completely free and can be downloaded um, from from the web. Um, there are others called JAWS. Um, you know, that's those are screen readers. But you can also get software that can essentially be embedded inside software programs themselves. So for example, like Microsoft Word, it has a, a feature called Read Aloud. Um, now that isn't technically isn't a screen reader, but it does actually read the content within the Word document. So the, the, there are those types of software as well. As well, Ho hopefully that answers that question. Can I ask something? Um, sure. I'm sure I'm going to get kicked when I get back in the office. But how many blind people are? Is it really going to affect? Does it really matter? Uh, why okay. does it matter? Okay, well, uh, that's again, that's an excellent question. So, in, in, in total, there's there's about one percent of the population. You think, well, you know, there's such a small percentage of the population. Mm. Why yeah. why bother? Well, actually, it's uh, it's really important because I think think about it. Think of it like this. Okay, um, put yourself in 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 a person's shoes. You know, even mm -hmm. if it's just one person and you're trying to access a website um, and you and you can't see. Um, how's it going to make you feel how, how are you going to feel about that organization if they can't pretty rubbish yeah you know, you're going to be put in and even if that's just one person mm. uh, that one person could tell somebody okay. else and just say okay I've, I've had a negative experience um you know and as they say word of mouth um, it can actually so the reputational quite, risk uh, let alone yeah, exactly. the legal risk uh, exactly quite high the, the actually the biggest lawsuit in america was uh, on the, on that issue uh, in really? audit, uh, yeah tens of millions of dollars uh, organizations who were not accessible to blind uh, users and in any wow. case if you go back to great Phil Friend is a mm. everyone knows Phil Friend he once said look um, if I can't transact in a shop yeah they lose their business they lose their business not just from me but my family too because I am the one with the spending power yeah. I am not going to that shop my kids are not going to that shop my wife is not going so so how is that for business uh, case for doing things properly so yeah, I think there is. It's not about just the visual impairment, the numbers. If you can't get it right for that, it means you can't get it right for the other ninety-nine percent. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very straightforward, simple thing to do. We had a, a great example a few years ago with, with, I think I can name them, with Tesco's. They had their ordinary site. We got them to build um, an accessible site for people with disabilities. And what they found was that everybody migrated from the original site across to the accessible site, because guess what? It was accessible for everybody. So it didn't matter if they had a disability. It was just simple, straightforward and clear. That's the word. It was simple. Once you design yeah. something accessibly, it makes it simple. It makes it even much better for SEO, that search engine optimization. So people can get noticed quicker when people are doing a Google search. These are all really key business benefits, yeah. but of course, on top of that, it is a must for disabled people to have that position. Yeah. And I, just, to, to, just, to, just to add to that as well, I'd say that um, in, in terms of digital accessibility, is uh, it's what we, re we refer to as digital inclusion. Uh, you know, if you if you um, address the barriers that are faced by disabled people, you ultimately end up making, as you know, as NASA and Trace were saying that. Um, you ultimately end up making your website not only simple to use, but it's uh, uh, available to everybody. Everybody can use mm. it. So regardless of your age, um, you know, your, your, the, the demographic you're in, everybody can use it. Which is a win-win, um, isn't it? We have two more questions here. Sure. Um, one, um, the first one is, are there suggestions on how to make things like dashboards accessible, where there are graphs and pie charts how could they be read by screen readers? Okay, I'd say in, in those uh, sort of situations, you, you're then getting into um, slightly more, well, you know, fairly advanced uh, accessibility. But again, it's not, it's not sort of um, massively complex to do. It's just, it's basically uh, to, to break it down into to bite-sized chunks. Now, um, for, for things like dashboards where there are graphs, uh, you, can, you can get, um, uh, you know, functions within screen readers that can that can that can specify, for example, you know, um, 
if you like, like for example, you have a graph, you have like you know the axes, uh, you have the actual data data points on right. the graph. You can actually um, uh, interrogate those, uh, but it's in terms of the, the navigation, and this is where it's it's critical to have uh, the graph set up correctly. Now, you can do it that way. One of the other options is to essentially create a um, a fairly high resolution graphic, obviously that's appropriate to a website that then has alternative text description mm -hmm. um, that's, that's an, an image of that graph. So you can do it both ways. Mm -hmm. I'd say probably the simpler version is to go for the, for, for the you know, fairly high quality image of the graph itself and then just to have uh, alternative text description uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, written, written in. Mm -hmm. Um, and the same person said, we have tried labels, however, then it looks too busy and inaccessible visually. Yeah, um, that, I, that's absolutely spot on. So hence why I suggested the, um, the uh, you know, alternative text, uh, essentially flattening the image and, and creating a graphic that you then provide alternative text for, for exactly that reason, because it, it starts to get quite... Um, uh, basically just too busy uh, the image uh, uh, from a from a visual uh, perspective really um, um thank you neil and That's we right. have another one what about someone who has a hand impairment for example can't use a mouse Okay, uh, excellent question. Uh, okay, so that uh, is where we, we start to move into what's what's called uh, motor impairments. Um, and there is a, a, a massive range of assistive technology out there. Uh, in particular, there's what we refer to as a switch. So um, you, you you might have seen examples of this in you know in the films, etc., and what have you. So um, uh, you know, there, there are examples where if you if you can't use your limbs, uh, you can use a, a puffer. So you know you just basically blow into a pipe, which is connected to the computer, and it allows you to make certain choices. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, you can do oh, that. Cool. <laughs> um, there's there's also examples as, as well as say if you're in a in a in a in a wheelchair, and again you've got very limited use of your limbs. Or you know I've actually um, met someone who who had no arms, um, and totally totally um, able to navigate their computer by using a switch that was near their foot on the floor wow. so they were able to make you know basically yes no choices mm -hmm. uh, using the switch well but neil and his colleague are working on on something called the multi-factor authentication for disabled people can you imagine how complex trying wow. to get through the security barriers of websites banking finance so we are actually working on a protocol and how that can be achieved using all sorts of solutions that the disabled people can access so I'm sure it's a separate session for that. It's a bit more highly technical for people who are really interested in that. Uh, but we have a, a recently a secondment from a doctorate graduate who's working on that area. And hopefully we can actually start talking about this soon. Had, hadn't even considered getting through security. I mean, I struggle <laughs> working from home. Yeah. But, so the MFA uh, stuff is, is just really imagine it, dementia. It, it more so, yeah. Even more so, yeah. yeah. Just imagine yeah. dementia, remembering passwords and of trying course. to go and withdraw money from a cash point. These are all real serious problems. And, and obviously the IT mm. is moving at a light speed. So how do you keep um, everyone on that journey rather yeah. than just living behind. Wow. So yeah, that, so there's a lot of work going on in that area. And as I said, Neil has got a wealth of information that uh, can't, it's not the uh, appropriate platform, but certainly something um, we can help. Uh, Neil, with organizations. How, how do you work out who, who you're working with? I mean, we, you've got clients coming to you via, obviously the, the, the offices at Microlink. Um, do you do much in terms of marketing what you do? Because, you know, I had a good old rummage around just for being nosy. Um, and I think it's, it's, you've got quite a big team now actually doing both PDF remediation and obviously web um, accessibility and mobile accessibility. That's so correct. How are you getting out there? How do people learn about you and what you're doing? Uh, okay, so as, as you quite rightly say, you know, particularly through through marketing, you know, directly from marketing mm. itself, um, but also just through through word of mouth um, uh, and through existing clients and you know partners. Uh, so that, you know, mm. and also just generally just personally through my own. Um, you, know, uh, you know, social media accounts, et cetera, yeah. and also the company's social media outlets. Um, and so people are beginning to find out about what we're doing. Now, as and then Nasa mentioned earlier, I think one, one of the projects that I'm, I've, um, it has to actually be said, it's from a personal point of view, one, one of, um, you know, the, the, the best things I've worked on is, uh, is 
uh, being involved in terms of PD for mediation and bringing mm. on board uh, autistic candidates who um, are essentially a, a, a vast untapped talent pool. Yeah. Uh, they have extraordinary capabilities um, and they, they, they're working in terms of PD for mediation. So I'm tra training them up in, in the team yeah. that I'm in and yeah. uh, uh, providing them with, uh, with work experience. And we're working directly uh, with uh, a London Borough Council uh, and who uh, have also been very helpful in, in uh, um, getting this up and running. And uh, it's going really well. So we're, we're actually starting to work on live documents uh, so that by providing that work experience, that training, yeah. uh, then enables the autistic candidates to become um, actually you know, quite attractive. They're quite to skilled, aren't they? Yeah, quite skilled to an employer yeah. because, yeah. particularly in the public sector, there's there's a lot of a lot of you know organisations who are crying out for the skill set. Mm. So uh, you know, and we can we can offer that. And just imagine thousands of graduates from universities who have Absolutely. been unable to get jobs yeah. because of their condition. Now we can bring them do the kind of work that even education sector requires and needs to, but they can't do at the moment. So the opportunities are huge and we're working with several organizations who are waiting for this project to be um, um, into operation. So we're going to bring them and, and do the same with them. So uh, it's a, a massive opportunity for both the clients who want to do it as well as those yeah. who are looking for jobs. And, and future clients, to be fair, oh, because absolutely. we're actually going to we're actually going to be placing these people. Yeah. Oh, I am when you're not looking, um, Neil. Absolutely. I should be <laughs> shoving out the back door into new jobs once they've finished your program. But it, it, it's all good stuff. And it's taught us, I think, quite a lot about working with specifically neurodiverse people, absolutely. hasn't it? Absolutely. 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 Uh, um, and I, yes, um, yes, that's a day. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, there are two more questions. And um, someone said, please, Neil, can you let me know how would that help on my website, which is Prestige in Touch? I would like to have it on for the future. Many thanks. I'm not sure uh, what she's referring to, but. Uh, probably logo. Uh, is it the, the, the logo, maybe the branding? I'm uh, hoping want... that she will. Um answer that question soon okay i mean if, if uh, you, but we uh, have uh, another question sure. um, um until she answers that question um someone said can you please talk about more alt text okay so, so alt text. text yeah yeah sure yes um okay uh so okay so i think um pr probably the best thing to to be, to be aware of now this is not only for for your websites but also for um uh, you know, actually authoring uh, documents. So, for example, using Word, uh, you know, even PowerPoint as well, um, and you know, creating PDFs as well. So, uh, alt text isn't just for the web. So, uh, essentially, by what we mean by alt text is alt an alternative text description. So, that's for uh, an image that might appear on a website or it might appear in a document, oh. um, etc. So, it's it's text that is essentially um, connected to the image. Uh, that as, when a screen reader comes across it, so as, as a, a, you know, for example, a blind person is navigating through, uh, through a document and they come across an image. Now, if it didn't have alt text, uh, you, the screen reader would just read blank. It just says blank. So, you know, how's the screen reader user? You know, so if you're blind and you think, okay, I can't see this image, what's there? Now, if you have the alt text available, the screen reader can pick it up and it says, you know, this is, this is a picture of a kitten, for example. Mm. So I had a quick look at um, the website um, and it's very pretty logo, but obviously full of colors um, and obviously contrast. So somebody with visual impairment, can they see that? Do you want them to see the logo? Because you spend a lot of time designing such a fantastic looking uh, logo. And so, yeah, there are, there are things you should do on that just to make sure the color contrast is good. And maybe uh, even the description as an old text description and these are quite good. And the website looks uh, amazing. It's really, really good. But certainly you could, you know, look into the accessibility just to make even that more powerful. You could certainly have a conversation with Neil. Absolutely, it. I'd be more than happy to, to, to um, take that further. It's not a problem. Can I ask you a quick question? It might not be quite, because I'm not very technically. Um, That's right, right, no problem. What, I, I always say this wrong, so apologies if I get it completely wrong. What is it about, is it camel stuff? when you're doing hashtags on websites that you're supposed to 
capitalise the first yeah. letter of every word. Is it cameling? Have I got the wrong word completely? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. So if you were to put a big hashtag, long word, yeah. then the screen readers just read it as like a character. Whereas if you do a capital, uh, you know, um, accessibility for all, as in A capital, F for, and A, and oh, okay. then it actually breaks that, and then it will read it as it is, rather than as one big wor word. So, yeah. yes, it is a... So it might trick. be capitalizing rather than cameling. But no, it is actually, <laughs> it is like, <laughs> what it does, it actually does look like a camel's back, so you just, oh. yeah, so you do capital, small, and right. capital, okay. small. Okay, okay, okay yeah. that makes sense. There, there it, is a technique. It is, it is camel case. Camel oh, case. Camel, camel case. case. Yeah, so it, it. it is actually, it kind of, a, as I said, it's a capital and then make it small letters and then capital. So it does give you the hum and the screen reader realizes it's a word in itself. And then it can repeat the words as in. Fabulous. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It, um, and Nicola answered the question about the uh, website. She asked, I am speaking about the product they are introducing for website and social media. That's what she was referring to. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you might be referring to maybe like um, something like Recite Me or something like that on your website. It, it, it's essentially it's a plugin. Uh, right. to, well, to, to, is, these are the overlays, Neil. Is, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that, uh, I'm assuming that's an overlay, uh, Nicole. It's a plugin. It's a yeah, lucky it's plugin a plug that yeah. mm. it does the obvious. Yes, she confirmed, yes. Yeah, right, yeah, that's it, it, that's it, yeah. So it is, it is something, it's a, like, like a, as I said, it's a, a half-hearted attempt of, fixing something and similar to the example of a restaurant where you say, well, I can't get you going to the main area, but I'll put a little corner here for you. It's not really a good fix. A short term, it's okay. But there's no substitute. Gap, um, yeah. There's no right. substitute for actually going back to the basics and designing no, it absolutely. from proper. Um, and the cost, is it free or is there any cost to it? To uh, it, what? It, 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 it depends. Like it, it depends which which uh, um, uh, plugin you use. Now there is one that is free. Um, it's called AT Bar, um, and it's cross browser, so that is completely free. Recite me, I think. I think is, a is, is there, there is, is a charge. Yeah. There is there is one in uh, a French one. It's called Facilité, and that one is quite good, and it could be customizable. But there is like you could have to pay some support fees if you want That's any it. help. Mm. So there is always uh, those uh, plugins, and uh, but it, as I said, it's a short-term measure. You shouldn't be using that as a your full solution. Can no, I no, ask I you about totally PDFs, Neil? Just in terms of, I mean, we all get PDFs, and I thought the whole point of a PDF was it was a kind of a closed document. So when you're sending out job offers and things like that, because I work in recruitment, that nobody can go in and change what the salary is, for example. So does everybody have to make them accessible? Is that not defeating what a PDF is? Uh, okay, so uh, on, on that note, yes, in terms of the public sector body's accessibility regulations, uh, I think it's uh, for PDFs that were, uh, have been produced after the September the 23rd, 2018, need to be accessible. Oh, gosh. So, yes, so, that must be a hell of a lot. Yeah, so, 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 so after 2018, everything has to be accessible in terms of PDF documents. Anything before that um, isn't, uh, is, is outside, what we call outside of scope. So right. that it doesn't need to be changed, except if it's a document that's required, for example, like you know, ordering, um, you know, if, if you're in, a, you know, in, the, in the educational sector, like you know, at school yeah. or something like that, or maybe at university um, or you know, in a um, maybe a county council where you have a form where they actually need to order something, then, right. then, it, then it needs to be accessible. Uh, but then the, the, the question is, if they were useful before, just because they're not accessible, by withdrawing it from public, you're depriving the public exactly. from info, Im, important information. Exactly. Therefore, exactly. you have to really work towards getting them more accessible, getting them accessible, so you could put them, put them back onto the public domain. That's uh, I, I mean, some people have decided due to the volume of work they have to do, it's mm. best to just deny the public from accessing them because otherwise they'll be breaking the breaching the, um, the rules. However, the principle is, of course, it helps the public and you have to make it available, but you have to make it accessible as well. Exactly. It's yeah. So it's not just UK, it's Europe and America. Everybody is doing it because right. it is really the right thing to do. Do people no, just take this kind of work and, and chuck it abroad? 
Do they offshore it? What's the benefit for you doing it, for example, Neil, over sending it somewhere else? Uh, OK, I think, uh, you know, certainly no criticism of other sort of, you know, uh, organisations trying to do it. But I think just simply, um, you know, uh, it, it's also it, it helps internally within the country um, mm. to to, uh, you know, encourage the economy within the within the country, you know, keeping work within this Good country. Um, but also as well, just simply that um, uh, if you if you're operating with with companies like microlink we have an understanding particularly of the public sector and mm. you know, we, we've worked with public sector organizations so we understand the culture now if you are um, you know outside of the country you might not be aware of that cultural sort of aspect um, and, and how, so how it's quite how, nuanced what you yes, do it's, well, exactly. it's actually more importantly the security requirements the GDPR, oh, no, that's an um, interesting one isn't yeah, it? I mean, yeah how do you have a relationship with an offshore company yeah. that you've got um, potentially sensitive information onto that document so you are you got to be very careful not to do this ideally Absolutely. organizations would want to do it in-house yeah therefore our hybrid um, uh, offering of we'll train up these people for you we'll give them the tools they need and the training and and the know-how and also the wraparound service about how to mm. look after them then within six months you employ them so they work for you doing the same work Meanwhile, yeah. we just simply charge them per page, which is very competitive compared to what you get from outside UK as well. But mm. at the same time, it's a massive social impact value on that. Yeah, I love social impact. And on the security you mentioned, Neil, am I allowed to? Well, I'm going to mention it anyway. You can tell me off later. The fact that you've actually got security clearance from the Metropolitan Police because yep. they're asking you to do some work there. I've said it. Am I in trouble? No, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. It shows, not at all. It shows they are very proactive and they take <laughs> this very seriously. And I, in fact, we should give them, a, you know, a shout out to Met Police because they're doing a yeah, great job sure. in accessibility. But it's um, good that you've got so, that clearance. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, sorry we've today. got a few more questions here, and we've mm. got um, less than twenty minutes now. So someone said, "I have not looked at Microlink website, but assume it's accessible on the lines of today's conversation." Yes, of course. You should it is. hope yes. so. There'd be people in trouble if it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and um, another one, aside from captioning and providing transcripts, can you do anything else to make videos that are embedded on a website accessible? Uh, well, I think the number one, of course, the caption is important, but synch synchronized, uh, so timestamp, so that you don't become out of sync. But the most important thing about videos, of course, if you use the YouTube, should be okay. Can you navigate to the start pause button using the keyboard or your screen reader? Because some of the um, video players are not. So, um, and then audio description is quite important as well. Because if you've got blank moments in a, in a video, mm. uh, how does a blind person know you're actually showing anything? So you've got to do audio description as well. So there are quite things you could do. Absolutely. I think, I think to, to add to that as well is that uh, particularly if you have uh, cognitive impairments, now this does depend on the media player that you're using, um, is whether or not you can actually speed up or slow down the content. Now this mm, is really point. useful for those with cognitive impairments, but particularly if you know, you, you, you're know you autistic or you have, uh, you're dyslexic, is um, being able to slow the content down and just to, to, to revisit and say, okay, yes, I've understood that, I can now yeah. move on. Well, actually, even the opposite. If you are, if you use a, see a blind user using a, either audio or video, they go with five times the speed because that's how fast the brain can process information. Wow! They just get bored watching the video, like you're not. <laughs> Honestly, I, it's unbelievable. I've spent some time previously with David Blunkett, and mm. he uses his recorder. He's got such an amazing memory. And the way he listens to that, it wouldn't make any sense to an ordinary person. Wow. He's so fast. So th there are lots of um, people out there who can actually process information at 500% of what I can. So that's superpower. I was, was going to say, I, I, a friend of mine, a, a blind, blind from birth, he, he uses a screen reader at 1,200 words a minute. Yeah, and it, it literally it sounds uh, like a buzzing bee. That's yeah. I, I, I can't actually different. Yeah, Absolutely. Yep. Talk, yep. About wow. super, talk about super. Talk about superpower. That and is a superpower, uh, isn't it? There, the, there was a uh, case in Sweden. I can't remember exactly when and who. This person um, solved 
crimes that other um, uh, forensic criminal this is the blind guy isn't it the visually a blind guy yeah. he could detect sounds in the background nobody else could do and it could make a difference to the outcome of the case so wow. yeah let's, I mean if they wanted a case for employing disabled people autistic people blind people deaf people um, you know can do such amazing work I mean yeah. we are working on a global um, um, it's a philanthropy but it's also a global education and um, empowerment we're working with a company who produce um, solar powered batteries for uh, and also hearing aids uh, mm -hmm. Manufactured by deaf people because deaf people have the best hand to eye coordination. They become perfect for assembling these components and they sell it somewhere like 20% of the market price in those countries. Even in, in China, they changed the rules for disabled people, like deaf people, to work in the assembly, whereas previously they were only allowed to work in uh, art and creative kind of a uh, yeah. Sector. Well, so, it used to be basket weavers and piano tuners over here. And absolutely. So, yep. so, so if, we've moved on, a, maybe. Disabled people can do amazing stuff when it comes to accessibility. We, again, we've got uh, user groups that could actually look at your site and say, ah, it's not accessible and it's not usable. It, it yeah. might be accessible, but yeah. it's not usable. So, so you do need to use engage with the disabled community if you want to design things. Right, and I'm going to introduce because I think Asada has got some more questions. We've got a short amount of time. Um, Asada, did we have more? Yes, yes, I have. Um, so, if your website is inaccessible and it's very hard to retrofit, as mentioned, what would you suggest would be the steps to make the change? Is there a good way to retrofit or would you need to start from scratch? Again, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, my personal take on this is it would actually be quicker and cheaper in the long run to start from scratch than to try to, to, necessary, wow. to, to, to retrofit. Um, you can retrofit certain aspects um, with a little bit of implementation, yeah. but but I would say that if it's if it's a, a big website and you've got you know, serious accessibility problems, you'd actually save money by just saying, okay, right, we, we know that the existing it's rather like the example that Tracy Tesco's. gave earlier with yeah. Tesco's yeah. that they did exactly the same thing. So they basically they just they, they they ran another website that was accessible that they built very quickly from scratch. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's 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 understanding how to build it from scratch uh, in an accessible way. That's can important. I can I make a point here? If you're a public sector, yep. you shouldn't be asking that question because you should be doing it regardless how you do it. It's got to be done properly. If you're in private sector. You should choose your suppliers carefully because there are companies out there who do design and build accessible websites. So if your current one doesn't, then maybe you should be looking can, around. Can we share a list of people? Do we have? A list? Uh, I, I uh, think it, it pretty much a lot of the good ones, um, you know, popular ones, have taken on board the accessibility and and doing a decent job. Um, I think the Business Disability Forum um, Accessibility Task Force. Uh, mm. good companies got together yeah. trying to make everything accessible so yeah there might be guides where um, where you could find a good company who could do the kind mm. of work for you another question of the day um so yes um is september 2018 deadline just for public sector organizations or does it apply to private sector and nfp Okay, that's a very good question again. Um, uh, so the September 2018 uh, applies just to public sector at the moment, uh, but uh, bear in mind, uh, you do need to be aware of the um, uh, the Equality Act 20, uh, mm. Equality Act 2010, uh, yeah. and you, you, you're required. You know, so this is all organisations are required by law to to make reasonable adjustments. And so yeah. technically, you could argue that yes, you know, a reasonable adjustment would be that if it's a PDF that it's, it's essential to the person to use to get access to information. So whether it's you know, if you're if you're a company or a public sector organisation, if that document actually is critical to their to their need in, in, in terms of information gathering, yeah. then yes. But with the private sector, the biggest driver, do I need that customer? Well, yeah. if you think you're that good that you don't need 20% of the population, then I guess you can carry on doing it. However, all the major companies have actually spent, invested to make sure they are accessible. So you might end up playing catch up. Yeah. It, it's, it's a real clear choice, um, you know, 
um, because people that fight for even half a percentage of market share. Just imagine 20% yeah. after and it's not yeah. been addressed. That's not really And it's thing. interesting as well when you're looking at the accessible websites is, is companies tend to fragment their websites. And I know on the recruitment side, when I did a, a, an overview of the top 500 companies in the UK, I found over 80% of them weren't accessible. Yeah. So it's really important. Yeah. yeah, it's really important yeah. that you, you don't just look at your core business, but you look at the sideways bits as well. Um, but they are definitely on the, in the right direction of actually looking at redesigning or doing it from the sure. basic principle. And that's, it will take time, but hence the smaller private sector, more agile companies should be doing this ahead of the big players mm. who could actually, once they get it right, then obviously they can have the entire Or oh, failing market. that, come and talk to Neil, have an oh, accessibility audit that, done. That, 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 I'll, we'll be, I'll be all ears, I'll be all, be all ears. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any more questions, um, Azadeh? Um, are you doing training on this, please? Is there a cost for training and how much? Thanks. That's an excellent question. We certainly can provide training. I think NASA, you know, in terms of um, something that we could offer. Mm. But, but there, there are, there are um, hybrid solutions of, um, we could certainly advise on what you need to do, like doing an audit. And once you've got the audit, these are the things you need to fix. Once you know how to fix them, because as a, as a programmer or as a developer, you know the stuff you need to do. You just don't know that you need to do them. So yeah. that's one way of getting to know you need to make the changes and you could talk to your developer. Um, there are also um, solutions that automatic um, um, uh, audits and automatic helping you to remediate to, a, to an extent and then it will help you how to do the rest by auditing any more development uh, job being done. Again, we can obviously introduce you to those tools if you want to actually use that kind of a method. So th there are lots of options. And yeah, absolutely, we can help in, in many ways. Um, we've also done training. Neil did some training with the Center of Accessible Environments. That's correct. Environment C recently. CAE, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So certainly yeah. if you wanted something actually tailored to your organization and your developers, that's something that we can do. There is, there is that uh, side of the company and who is doing it? Is it in-house or is that outsourced? Mm. And what do you need to fix? What's the um, low hanging fruit? What are the priorities? So these are all the considerations when it comes to, um, you know, doing your website and planning your website to be accessible. So step by step doesn't have to happen overnight, but at least you will put it on your site map uh, of where you are on that journey yeah. and the timeline you want to get there. So at least you show your commitment and certainly the public who come and visit at least will give you a breathing space. Say, yep, they are doing this, so I'll wait yeah. a bit more. And in yeah. fact, just to, just to, to add to that, I think that because that's a really important point NASA's made is um, in terms of providing your accessibility statement uh, on your website. Um, so you know, use, you know, by all means, use your accessibility statement to, to show that journey, you know, wh where you're at, you know, kind of, you know, okay, these, these are things that we've mm. resolved. Um, these are things that we need to improve. Um, and also don't be afraid to, you know, to shout about it, you know, you know use it as kudos. Say, look, you know, we are actually addressing. Great idea. You know, and Great you know, idea. Yeah. point people to your accessibility statement. Now, I know for many disabled people, that will be the first place they'll look on the website is your accessibility uh, statement. Oh. Yep. Uh, well, one thing you will discover, there are a lot more disabled people working within the organization hmm. under the radar who are not flagging up, maybe not even, um, maybe underachieving. Once you start going out trying to fix the public facing, your, you know, your, your window shop, you actually find that you could do a lot for your um, current workforce and to make them more productive, retain their staff, and obviously, bottom yep. line is attracting the right client, the uh, right type of, of employees. So yep. they're all linked together. They're all joined up in, in this correct principle of making sure you include everyone on this journey. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, there is, uh, there are two more questions. One, sure. um, is that usually at the bottom of your website under accessibility or is that just jargon and website in fact may not be accessible in the sense discussed today? 
Again, excellent question. Um, I mean, on many websites, you'll notice that uh, as a person's describing, the, usually in the footer, it's, it's got the word like a, it's a link that just says accessibility. You can place your accessibility statement there um, by all means. It's entirely up to you where, where you place it. Um, but if, if, you, if you're going to put it in the footer, that's, that's, there's no issue with that. Uh, what I would just be my own personal take on it is just in terms of wording is on the link is instead of just saying accessibility say accessibility statement uh, because people recognize that um, that sort of terminology um, so uh, if it's a, if it's in the footer uh, is to maybe uh, have something that will direct particularly if they're a first time user of the website just to say hey look you know there is there is this link you know accessibility statement um, maybe maybe having that as a top banner something that they read first off just to say you know there is this information available um, and you know particularly for first time users if the person's used the website obviously before then they'd, they'd know to go to the link and that that statement could potentially tell your um, visitors the things you can do today and the things you are working on so uh, if you go to some sites and in order for them to pretend they are accessible they could put something like yeah you can change the color on the screen but it doesn't do anything else i mean mm. that's a, a false pretense and if you're really going to do this um map out you know do a roadmap of what you yeah. need to achieve yeah. in what time period and and do those quick wins do them and then and then work towards the longer objectives it's much easier once you start the journey yeah. I'm assuming a lot of the people here are involved with accessibility and have, have some technical knowledge because they, they, if they knew what the problem was, I'm sure they would be able to fix it uh, very of quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And one other thing I might add as well is, is um, okay, even if you were to produce the most amazing accessible website, if you were then to put content on it, like, for example, a PDF, and that PDF is inaccessible, it's mm. kind of defe defeating yeah. the object. So you know, to, to, to have, you know, bear that in mind, be mindful of the entire uh, user experience through, through your website, including additional resources like PDFs and other, other documentation. Yeah. And, and then how do you train your internal workforce to be able to produce them accessibly? So we designed the e-learning give that, uh, those instructions in like bite-sized 20 minute learning mm. about how to make PowerPoint accessible. Then you can send them this uh, video content, they watch it, they practice, and then they can from there onwards, they don't need to be reminded, they'll do it. So yeah, it, it is a two part journey. You make your website accessible or your content, content accessible, then you keep it accessible. That yeah. second part requires to educate the rest of the population. Yeah. I think we've got one last question um, with three yes, minutes we've to the got, end. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, do you need an accessibility statement if not public sector? Again, that's a superb question. Um, I, I would I would recommend yes using using an accessibility. It's got statement. to be good even, practice. Even, isn't yeah, it? yeah, it's, it's got to be good practice. And 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 also just to to say that um, the gov.uk website actually provide a template accessibility statement. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know you use that as a sort of a starting point. Yeah. Um, so even if you aren't public sector, I would recommend still using yeah. a, an accessibility statement. Uh, uh, well, the, the the warning for private sector. It is actually being put into a public sector contract that you need to be. So yeah. even if you don't think this is really not going to affect me, if you are doing public sector contracts or even private sector contracts, they will ask you about your accessibility. So it, it is worth investing in it. And certainly you, start, you, should, you should be on that journey already. Have we got another question there, Azadeh? Um, it's not a question. Nicola says, thank you, everyone. Please let me know when you are having a training. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, if, uh, if we if we wrap up there, because we've got like a minute and a half, I think. Okay. Um, Neil, fabulous. It's great to see your enthusiasm and passion. Absolutely. Thank for you something very much. something that is just really weird from my point of view. But mm. if they weren't accessible, I couldn't go shopping online. And that's really important to me. Yeah. Because where Absolutely. else am I going to spend my money? You know, when mm -hmm. we've been isolated with all the things that have been going on, um, we can't really forget that we need to be as inclusive as possible. Yeah, well, totally, totally agree. My, my, my takeaway from this would be, it is a problem that needs to be fixed, but it's not a problem, it's a requirement. Everybody needs to do it for best practice. And there is a huge pool of talent coming out yeah. of education who don't normally find jobs because of the way 
the recruitments are and they, they, they're, they're definitely the type of people who could help you so again reach out to us if you are in the yeah, public sure. sector we can we can certainly help they share those um, um, projects that we've been doing case studies so uh, certainly we can get you on that journey as well very quickly wonderful so in terms of the recording there was a little note there we will be sending out the recording to anyone who would like to see it but thank you ever so much for joining us thursday the resources are coming out so that's wonderfully quick but it's been fabulous thank you very Absolutely. much likewise thank, thank you, you. thank bye you bye. very much cheerio bye bye, bye, -bye.